we're in a series um, on learning how to love. Because if, if we'd be honest, and, and as Christians it would be great if we were all honest all the time. Uh, at, at, based upon the number of times we get offended, that we get in conflict with other people, we have to come to the conclusion that we don't always know how to love. Stuff gets in the way of us loving. And so as we've gone through this series, one of the first things we discovered is that there's four, actually four different kinds of love described in the Bible. There's this eros love, which is the sensual sexual love uh, between a man and a woman. There's philia love, which is brotherly love that you would have. It's like fraternal love that you have between brothers and sisters in the Lord, or just, you know, band of brothers type stuff. There's this storge love, which is family love that a family has for, for it, you know, brothers and sisters, a mom and dad, and, and, and you know, things like that. The, that storge love, just a natural affection inside a family. And there's this thing called agape love, which we call God's love, because the Bible says that God is, not has, but God is agape love. God is agape love. And so agape love can really only be expressed with the help of God, because God is agape love, okay? And, and just before Jesus went into heaven, he said to disciples, I'm going to give you a new commandment, and this new commandment is that you're all going to have to learn how to love each other now with agape love, because I'm about to go into heaven, right? I've died for your sins, I've gone, I'm going to heaven, and I'm going to pour out my spirit on you, and you're going to have the ability to love by God's love. And so he said, I got a new command for you. Learn how to love by that love. No longer by these other three loves, although they're good loves. I want you to learn how to love by God's love. And then he goes on and he says, well, I'll show you the verse. A new command I give you, love agape one another. As I have agape you, you must agape one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you agape one another. Jesus is saying that this ability to love one another with God's love would be the defining proof that we belong to him. If we don't love with his love, there's no defining proof, defining evidence that we're his. Okay? And last time we looked at some specific skills, right? We started looking at specific skills that we could learn to develop in our lives so that we could express agape love. And we, in a couple of the skills, uh, first skill was learn to ask questions. Just instead of just talking to people and communicating to them what we know, learn to ask questions. Because as Jesus did, when we learn to ask questions, we get to know people. We know people as they are as we ask them questions. We also empower them through our questions. We help them to discover what's in their own lives. Questions are powerful for that. The second skill we learned was learning how to be a neighbor. Just learning how to just respond to what we see around us, to be a neighbor, that we can meet the needs of other people. We see them healed emotionally, uh, physically, uh, spiritually, um, mentally, worry, all these things, that we can just be a neighbor to people. Uh, today I want to give you a third skill. We're going to learn how to be interdependent. Why do we need to be interdependent? Because it's interdependence one to another that helps us to mature as people and helps us to mature other people. We're going to talk about that today. Before we do that, I, I, I was reading about redwood trees. I don't know if you've ever seen a redwood tree. They all grow to about 300 feet or more. They're huge. They're the tallest tree in the world, a redwood tree. And yet, surprisingly, its roots only go about 10 feet into the ground. You know how they survived, how they don't tip over? Because their roots go sideways and they interconnect with the other roots of the other redwood trees and they hold each other up. Isn't that interesting? And there's a beautiful picture there of the way that God wants us to live as Christians. That, that we, we can hold each other up as we're interdependent, as we intertwine with each other. Okay? Um, some people call this the, the, the principle of interdependence, and that's what I was calling it in this message, uh, we're not to be independent. You know, independent is, is, is when we're self-sufficient in ourselves. Um, codependent is when we're totally absorbed by someone else needing them. We're smothered by someone else. 
we put ourselves in a position where they, they, they where we where they cover us, we rely wholly on them. But interdependence is when we intertwine with other people and work together and support each other. Okay, so you can use that visual. Okay, independence, codependent, interdependent, and to help us understand what what God wants for our lives. You know, and, and the Bible actually teaches this concept of interdependence all over the New Testament, and, and it uses it uses a it describes it using a specific phrase, the phrase called um, one another. One another. In the New Testament, there are 100 references to one another's in 94 different verses. And these 100 references can be summarized in 12 summary statements. And what we want to do, what I want to do, what I want to do, hopefully you want to do it too, is look at six of those summary statements about about one another's today and, and the other six next week okay so let's look at the first one pray for one another and, and there's many verses under each one of these uh, 12 things but I just want to show you one of them James 5 16 therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective um, the prayer of a righteous man, a righteous woman, a righteous person is power and effective. See, see, in Christ we're all righteous. We've been made righteous by Jesus Christ. But in the context of this passage, of this verse, it's defining righteousness. A righteous person is someone who is getting their consciences clear by confessing their sins to one another and then keeping their consciences clear by praying for one another, okay? By asking for others to pray for them, that they may have the strength and healing to not do the thing again. And so for those type of people, the, not, not the perfect people, okay? If you're perfect, you probably aren't needed here today, okay? But for those people that are not perfect, for those who are desperate enough to be willing to confess their sins to other people, to try to keep themselves in a righteous state through confession and also through prayer, getting and listening prayer for help, the Bible says that those type of people, their prayer is powerful and effective. If you find that your prayers are not being powerful and effective, maybe because you're holding too much junk inside, you need to talk to somebody, right? No, really, it's like we, we clog up our prayer channels through unconfessed junk in our lives, right? So we pray for one another. And we have other people praying for us. And as we do that, we give a blessing and we receive a blessing. And you can get all this online uh, tomorrow. You can go to our website and download all these notes. But, so, but how do we pray for one another? You know, when someone, as Sandy said, if someone comes to the altar for prayer... Do we sit down and check our cell phones for our, all our text messages? Or do we focus on someone at the altar and say, God, I pray for that person. I bless that person. I pray for their salvation, for their deliverance, for their healing, for their breakthrough in their lives. There's a good time to pray. Well, I don't know who to pray for. I don't know anybody to pray for. Just come and see who's standing at the front and pray for them. That's a great way to learn how to pray. You know, and as if we're praying for, you know, afterwards during our fellowship time, as you're talking to someone during the fellowship time and someone shares a struggle in their lives, do you say, well, good luck? Or do you stop and put your hands on their shoulder and pray a short prayer? God, I just believe with my sister, my brother, for breakthrough, for, for healing, for, for whatever they need in their lives. There's so many opportunities to pray. And, you know, one of, one of my fun things I love doing these days is taking people for, for, for uh, coffee at, uh, you know, whatever restaurant, Tim Hortons, whatever. And before I go, I refuse to go before I hold their hand and I pray for the person right in the middle of the restaurant. And I, I, I'm a lot, you know, kind of one eye, kind of, a tiny bit open one eye as, as, I'm, as I'm looking and there's someone listening into my prayer where the waiter's standing there going, wow, you know, and they're hearing our confidence and faith in God. And then we see, you know, and just the way people are touched by prayer. Uh, people that are even uncomfortable praying in public, they're still touched by your prayer, you know. So 
you know, during the week? Do we pray for our spouses? Do you actually pray for your spouse during the week? Do you pray for your children? Do you pray for your family? Do you pray for your church? And you guys are lucky because I also get, I also pray for all my apostolic council. I pray for all my associate ministers, right? I pray for each one of you guys. So it's like, it's like, <laughs> you get off easy. No, some of you are a lot better faithful in prayer than I am. But the point is that if we're going to learn how to be interdependent, that we can learn how to love, we have to be learn to pray for one another. Because I'll tell you, the best, one of the best ways to fall in love with somebody, to really have a heart to them, is to pray for them consistently. Because as we said last time, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. As you put the treasure of your time into praying for someone, your heart follows. If you're having a, a strife with a, with a spouse, pray for them and your heart will turn to them. If you have a trouble with strife with a child, pray for them, your heart turns to them. If you have a struggle with your boss or some, yeah, or some obnoxious fellow worker, pray for them and your heart turns to them. You don't have that trouble, do you? Because you, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, okay, okay. Mike, he works with his two sons, so inside joke. Um, the Bible says pray for one another. For the prayers of a righteous person, those that confess their sins to one another and pray for one another, they're powerful and effective. And so if we consider ourselves righteous, we should be praying for others. We should be transparent to others. And if we don't consider ourselves righteous, then we should go to someone and confess to them and ask for prayer so we get righteous, right? So interdependent. A second thing, a second one another. Encourage one another. Hebrews 3.13. But encourage one another daily. And in the Greek, that word means daily. It doesn't mean year or eon. It means really does mean day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. And here's, here's the trick in this verse. When you wake up tomorrow, tomorrow is today. And when you wake up the day after that, that day is now today. So as long as it's called today, it's going to be called today until Jesus comes again. Do you understand that? This is a, this, tomorrow's going to be today. And tomorrow never comes. So this is a trick verse. This is saying every time you get up from your bed, it's today, now pray. You know, it's encouraged, let's encourage, let's encourage. Why? So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Isn't that an interesting verse? It's also a very interesting verse because it suggests a number of things. First, it suggests that the church members in those days were, were close enough relationally to each other. They actually had access to each other to encourage each other daily. They weren't disconnected. They didn't hide from each other from Monday to Saturday. They actually knew each other, saw each other during the week because they could encourage each other. Secondly, and this was before Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff, right? Daily to encourage. Second thing it suggests is the members actually knew enough about each other, other than their name, so that they could actually encourage each other effectively. I once went to this one church and I said uh, to the pastor, I said, um, uh, what, how, do you, how are you doing in your church? And he said, I, f I feel tricked. And I said, what do you mean you feel tricked? He said, when I came to this church, it was so amazing. Everybody called each other by their first name. Brother Bob, Sister Sue, you know, Brother, Brother Frank, and Sister Betty. And he said, I thought people were so close. But it turns out they didn't even know each other's last name. They had no idea what their last name was, where they lived. They'd never been to each other's homes. They basically came to the meeting and then scattered as quickly as possible. You know, like, this, this, this church was close enough that they knew each other well enough that they could actually encourage each other effectively. Okay? Third thing it suggests is that the members were transparent enough, they were willing to be transparent enough with each other that they allowed themselves to be known. When I was a teenager, I was so good at putting this wonderful wall in front of me that people thought they knew me and they didn't know me at all because I would only give surface information. And I was just this wonderful, friendly guy that nobody really knew. But my wife, Kathy, is very intrusive in that way and would not let me live with that. She learned how to get inside of me. And the point is, is that we have to be willing to be transparent to one another. Fourth thing it suggests is that Encouragement is the greatest weapon to sin's deceitfulness. Isn't that interesting? This verse is telling us that 
en encouraging one another is the greatest weapon we can use against the deceitfulness of sin that will harden our hearts. Because when we start to get depressed and say, well, nobody loves me, no one cares about me, God doesn't even know who I am, I'm so, you know, and then someone comes along and says, brother, I just felt today I needed to tell you that God loves you. I felt to, to just call you up today and let you know that you're precious to, to me and to God. And it just breaks off all that deceitfulness. It breaks off all that hardness. See, the power of encouragement. Um, fifth thing is that I cannot consistently overcome sin without your encouragement. I can't do it alone. I can't consistently fight against discouragement, depression, frustration, weariness, unless you come alongside of me now and then and say, hey, brother, just appreciate you. Not sure what's going on. I just felt to send you this little note today and say that I was thinking about you, praying for you. Man, I can't survive without your encouragement. You can't survive without mine. If you've tried it, you know. We need each other to encourage each other. But if we're going to be encouragers, we need to learn how to encourage. You know, telling someone that all their problems are due to sin or lack of faith is not encouragement. Okay? It's, just, it's just not. Pointing out all of a person's faults is not encouragement. Uh, telling people that everything's going to be okay when we all die and go to heaven is not encouragement because I have to live today, right? And honestly, simply say, hey, I'll be praying for you is not really encouragement. It's really not. Do you know what is encouragement? Saying, you know what? Man, that, that really bothers me. I'm going to pray for you every morning this week for the whole week, and I'll check up with you next week and see how you're doing. That's encouragement, okay? saying, hey, I believe in you. You have what it takes. I believe that with God's help, you can get through this. That's encouragement. Uh, saying, hey, I know a lawyer, an accountant, or uh, another resource that I'm willing to help pay for to help you get the help you need. That's encouragement. Saying, hey, I'm really concerned about you. Can, can we get together this week for coffee so that I can just understand your challenges more, because I really want to agree with you in prayer. That's encouragement, okay? Do we understand the difference between that versus be praying for you? As you walk away, oh, God, help that loser. <sighs> that's, that's, see, that's not encouragement, right? Where your treasure is, your heart is, right? <laughs> no, it's not, as a matter of fact. Now... <laughs> 20 years ago, there's another story, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. See, the word encourage literally means to encourage, to put in courage. If I'm encouraging you, I'm putting courage inside of you with my words, my, with my expressions, with my behavior. That's encouragement. And as we learn how to encourage others, we'll be known as people of encouragement. Another one. Build up or edify one another. First Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage one another and build up each other, just in fact you're doing. In Romans 14.19, let us therefore make every effort. Effort. It's hard work sometimes. Some people don't want to be encouraged. They don't want to be built up. They don't want to be edified. Sometimes it's hard work. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification, building up one another. Okay? Build up. Don't tear down. Build up. See, it's, it's too easy to um, see the faults in other people, to criticize people with, for those faults. You know, to look at a person, well, you're too critical. You're too negative. You're too um, confident. You're too aggressive. You're too impetuous. You're too naive. You're too shy. You're too, and you just fill in the blank. That, that doesn't help people at all. That's yeah, that's right. It's judgment. Judgment is tearing down. It really is. See, what isn't so easy to actually look inside a person to see their potential. You know, to actually take the time to look inside to see people's potential and emphasize that potential. To do that, you've got to spend time with other people and get to know them. To see what their potential is. Because you're not just... You know, we're not trying to flatter, uh, flatter, flatter, flatterize, flatter, I don't know, 
give people flattery. I don't, I'm making up words here. We're, we're, we're actually going to be honest and say, I see this inside of you. It's one thing to say, oh, I can see you're a great, powerful man of God. Well, if, if they're three feet tall, you know, it's like, you, 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 you got to get to know them. You got to know what's inside of them. And, and if, you see, if you see someone, no matter how big, how short they are, and you say, you are an incredibly loving person, they go, they took the time to see that. They took the time to get to know me. Can I erase this tape and start over? <laughs> I just, oh, dear. It's just, take the time to get to know what's inside of somebody. And speak that out. Because if you just lie at a person just to f give them some flattery, that's not going to work, right? It's not going to work. You know, interesting enough, the Bible says that when we prophesy, that's the very thing we're supposed to do. Every, 1 Corinthians 14, 3 and 4. Everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, their encouragement, and their comfort. He who prophesies edifies, edifies, edifies. You know, whether I'm speaking of thus saith the Lord or thus saith Pastor Dave, the goal has to be to edify, to build up, to strengthen. You know, Apostle Chuck used to uh, say that we don't need a prophet to see uh, something wrong with a person. All we need is at least one good eye and a critical spirit. You know, you know it's not a gift of God, right, to, to criticize someone. But, you know, to see... The potential in someone else. We need two eyes with 20-20 vision, right? And, and an encouraging word. We need to speak encouraging words. And sometimes it takes hard work, too. You know, because it's like becoming, you know, like here's this guy standing, sitting here, right? With this somber face. You don't really know how he's feeling, what he's thinking. But for me to build him up, I've got to become like an expert miner. And I've got to dig into his life and see the gold that's inside of his life and speak to that gold. That's what building up does, right? I've got to take the time to see the gold that's in him. Now, fortunately, we've known each other long enough. I've seen a, quite a bit of gold. And actually, you're married to some gold too, right? So that... that <laughs> it's like being miners. 1 Peter 2, 5, you also, like living stones, were being built, were being edified, were being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Hey, that doesn't just happen. You just don't throw a whole bunch of bricks on the ground and they suddenly become a house. It takes work to edify. It takes work to build up. It requires that we, we treat each other like expert builders and we take the time to build people together chip off their little imperfections through love. Okay. So we promote the good of the church, promoting the good of one another. Okay. In a school classroom, teachers have discovered the best way to see a student excel is just speak to their potential, just build them up, just encourage them. And if it's true, it's, it's also true for the Church of Christ. We build up each other. Fourth thing, confess to one another. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. We've already looked at this verse a bit, but I want to look at it a different, from a different angle. This whole thing about confessing one another. You know, whenever we see that verse, you say, yes, that person just needs to confess. If they would just confess, everything would be better. If they would just confess their sins and confess their whatevers. You know, you <laughs> If we're going to allow that to happen, that means we need to create a liberating environment where people are free to admit their failures. See, that, that just doesn't happen. You just don't command people to confess their sins and expect it to happen. We have to provide an environment, create an environment that's so free for people that it becomes a safe place for them to say, man, I'm struggling with this. And they know they're not going to be condemned or criticized. You know, one of the cool things, uh, I, I was talking to a certain person this last week, and they, you know, and they, they were trying to make the point that we really don't have anyone that we can be honest with. And they were trying to make that point. And they said, well, like you, Pastor Dave, like how many people do you feel that you could really trust to throw out your, your secret sins or whatever? 
And, and we, Kathy and I sat there, and we went 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And we got up to 16 or 17, and they said, shut up, you've made your point. <laughs> you know, and I said, look, I'm not perfect, but we understand how important this is. And so we've committed our lives to, to drawing around us transparent relationships, people we can trust with everything so that we are in a safe place. Unfortunately, most people haven't done that. But we, 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 as I said, we got up to almost two dozen, and, and, and what a safety there is. What a joy there is. You were on the list, actually, you guys, just so you know. Yeah. You know, because we, oh, thank you. So, you know, that's what we need in our lives. People that we can f confess. Because if we confess our sins to other, we'll be healed. Right? Begin revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. You're only as sick as, as only as sick as your secrets, right? Yeah, it is good. You're only as sick as your secrets. So, so if we're going to divide, d develop that healing uh, environment, first it means that we have to take responsibility for our own actions, and not just blame everybody else for our failures. It means that we have to take 100% responsibility for our failures, even if it's only 10% of the problem, right? If you're 10% wrong, fully admit 100% to that 10% wrong. And then leave it up to God to deal with that person, rather than demand they now, okay, I've, I've put out my 10% laundry, I want to see your 90% right now. No, leave it up to God to deal with their heart. It also means that we have to develop an atmosphere where people are safe to confess, where, where what is shared in a small group or over coffee doesn't end up on Facebook or on Twitter. Right? Yeah. <laughs> or, or it doesn't end up at the pulpit. Third, it means that we have to be willing to look beyond the sin and see the purpose of confession, and the purpose of confession is not punishment. The purpose of confession is always healing and restoration. Yeah. You know, do, do people feel more whole after they confess to us, or do they feel more sick? sick. If they feel sicker, we have, haven't learned how to receive a confession, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And fourth, it means we have to understand what sin really is. According to the Bible, sin is not breaking the Ten Commandments. Sin means missing, literally it means missing the mark of demonstrating the character of God. Every time we miss the mark of demonstrating God's love, God's character, that's sin. When, and so, <laughs> if we would learn that confessing our sins just doesn't mean confessing our major failures, but it means confessing our attitudes, our envy, our jealousy, our grudges, our fears, our unforgiveness, our, un our bitterness, our envy, our jealousy, our anger. And I can promise you that when you learn how to confess even those things, the, the freedom, the levels of, ex of freedom that we will experience We'll be, we'll be brand new, like we will be so free. We would never think it possible to be that free. As Jack Frost said, when you really learn to walk in the light, then the blood of Jesus is able to cleanse you from all sin. The problem is most of us walk in darkness. Yes, we're Christians, but our whole lives are in the darkness. We don't let any light on them. Our struggles, our fears, um, our secret sins, we keep them in the dark. But the Bible says the blood of Christ can only cleanse us from sin if we walk in the light. Is your life in the light? Are my, are my issues in my life in the light with somebody? Or am I keeping some things in the darkness? There's no cleansing for things that are in the dark. And, and let's remember that part of confession is, is, includes asking forgiveness for the things we've done wrong and hurt others with. And it may even mean uh, making amends. You know, saying, I'm sorry for ride, driving over your bike may not be enough. I may need to replace your bike, right? <laughs> so confess one to one another. Interdependence. Uh, honor one another. 
Romans 12, verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love and honor one another above yourselves. This is really another interesting verse because that word devoted is actually a compound Greek word. It's a compound word that means an intertwining of both filial love and, um, uh, what's the other word, storge love. So what it's saying, it's an intertwining of both brotherly love and family love together. That word devotion is those two Greek words used together. What it means is that I need to treat you as both you were my brother and sister in Christ as well as a family member. So there's a, a, a grace in my relationship to you as a brother and sister in Christ, but there's also a commitment to you as if you were my own flesh and blood. That's what that word devotion means. Okay. And it says, if you do that, when you have those two loves working together in your life, intertwined together, then you can really learn how to honor one another. And honor becomes a powerful force. Think it's, it's, it's one thing to say, well, I always honor my leaders, those jerks. <laughs> See, that's honor without devotion, right? That's honor without devotion. And, and therefore, honor becomes pretension. I, I was in a couple meetings years ago where I listened to these guys that couldn't stand each other get up and publicly honor each other because they didn't understand it had to be with devotion. Honor is not powerful unless there's a love in it. Okay? Um, it's, 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 it's not just choosing to honor people. It's choosing to actually be affectionate towards them as you're honoring them. It's not just choosing to honor others, but to go out of your way to actually lift them up above yourself. Right? And, and then let them, to receive, let them receive the praise without feeling envious or jealous or ignored. Right? Can we honor to that degree? It means to treat all other people with value and respect. How can we make it easier to honor other people? By realizing or reminding ourselves that no matter who they are or what they've done, each one has been created in the image of God. Right? Doesn't the Bible say that? They've been created in God's image. They are carriers. Each one of you is a carrier of God's image. And therefore, I can make, that makes it easier for me to honor you, knowing that you carry the likeness of God in you, and you deserve my honor. You deserve my respect simply because you've been created in God's image, and you carry God's image wherever you go. And I also remind you that as God's created image, as God's creation, you have gifts and talents and abilities in you that make you of great value. And so I honor your specific gifts, even though they may not be my gifts at all. I, I have to learn how to love and, and be devoted to and, and, and honor even right brain people, not just people who are left brain like me, <laughs> because we think differently, right? We act differently. We have different uh, uh, emphasis in life. But I treasure the creativity, the right brain creativity in them that makes them be able to think and do things that I could never do, right? So that helps me to honor every person when I realize God has created them differently for a purpose and there's a specific uh, contribution that they can make to this world, okay, as uh, wh whoever they are, okay. So we honor their reputation and we honor their time and we rep honor their needs above our own. That's what it's saying here. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Sixth thing. Try again. Love one another. John 13, 34, a new command I give you. We've always talked about this. Love one another as I've loved you. So you must love one another. You say, oh, well, this one's easy. I just got to love people. That's easy. No, it, it doesn't say that. Right? Do we see it doesn't say that? It doesn't say love one another. It says love others in the same way and to the same degree that Jesus loved us. Well, that's not so easy. It's not, it's, not as I, it's not I love you as long as you love me. It's not I love you as long as until you disappoint me and then I'm out of, there, out of here, right? Uh, it's, 
It's, I love you even as you're spitting on me. Right? Isn't that what Jesus did? I love you even as you drive the nails into my hands, thinking you're worshiping God and doing so. Boy, that's, that, that, that's more than filial love, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I love you, and even though you're all messed up, I'm willing to take the punishment for you, if I have to. <laughs> you know, love one another as I have loved you. It's, you know, do, do we love one another when love requires a lot more than words? It, one of the, one, again, I, I have all these revelations through my life, and one of the greatest revelations is, is com, always comes from my wife, Kathy. You know, as I've told you the story already, I used to say all the time, I love you, I, lo I love you, I love you. I'm so loving, and I say every day, I love you. And one day she says, Why? I, no, you don't understand how this works, right? I'm supposed to tell you I love you, and you're supposed to be all happy. And No, 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 why? I want to know specifically. Give me three specific reasons why you love me. Oh. Well, it should be, but we're back to this left-brained, fatherless son who's learning how to be a whole man, right? It's like, oh, okay, I love you because... You cook me meal? No, that. <laughs> no, I take I take that one back. Sorry, I take that one back. I love. I love you because you care enough for me to ch about me that, to challenge me every day when I become pretentious. Okay, I'll take that one. Okay, <laughs> it's like, thank you. <laughs> do we when we do we love when it's not convenient to love? Do we love when it hurts to love? <laughs> Do we love when it requires personal sacrifice to love? Do we, do we love when the other person rejects our love? Right. Love, oh, this is an easy verse. <laughs> And remember the next verse. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another like that. Can you imagine living each day, um, demonstrating a degree of love that is so strong that you'll be famous for it? That you'll actually be famous because of the depth of your love? Can you, can you imagine that all people all people would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you belong to Jesus because you love to that degree. It doesn't say all believers. It doesn't say uh, all people close to you. It doesn't say people within your church. It says that all men will know you're my disciples because you've learned how to love the way that Jesus loves. Can you imagine that people would look and say, there's no other possible explanation. This person must know Jesus. There's no other reason they're loving like this. W wouldn't it be amazing if we were known not for what we were against, but because we loved? All those Christians are against this and this and this and this and this. Wouldn't it be amazing if we weren't known for our buildings, but for our love? You know, well, where do they go? Where do they go? Who cares where they go? Do they love? Right? Wouldn't it be amazing if we weren't known for our theology, but for our love? Well, those Christians, they'd be this and this and this. Yeah, but do they love? Wouldn't it be amazing if we weren't known for our holidays and our rituals? Easter, Christmas, Lent. Still don't get that one. But anyway, uh, but f because we love? It doesn't matter how much ash I put on my face. Do I love you? 
By this all men will know that you're my disciples. It's not even about wearing the right t-shirt. You know that? I always thought if I just wore the right t-shirt, Jesus loves you. I was going to get one of those bumper stickers, right, that says that Jesus loves you, but I was afraid I might not live up to the bumper sticker. So. <laughs> yeah. Which reminds me of the story where this person started honking at this other person, and the, and the, and the Christian in the car turned around, stop honking at me! And they said, well, the sign says honk if you love Jesus. <laughs> oh, missed that one. <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing if we just had a deep, tender, and persevering love? See, this interdependence thing is a big deal. If we have it, it will change our relationships. It, 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 will, it will, we'll, we'll know how to love. And we won't be offended. We won't be upset all the time. And we won't get into conflict all the time. Because we're learning how to love. And it's like... Here, you want another nail? Here, here's another nail. I'll give one to you. Go ahead. <laughs> no, we, we, we hide all the nails and the hammer. And <laughs> Remember our theme song? Uh, working on it. There we go. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 13. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, and though I prophesy and understand all, Although I have all faith, so mountains may be removed. And though I feed the poor and give up my life, but if I don't have charity, the Greek word there is agape. If I don't have agape, if agape does not flow from me, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Jesus reduced me to love. Love is patient. Starting at verse 4, patient and kind. Love is not envious, not proud, not gentle, but, but gentle and meek. Seeks not its own way. Love sings when Jesus prevails, believes and endures all things. Love hopes and bears every wrong, and love never fails. If I have not charity, if love does not flow from me, I'm nothing. Jesus, reduce me to love. Whoops. One season I was a child. I spoke and I thought as a child, but when I turned to a man, I learned how to love. Put such ways I put aside, but now, though now I see through a glass, yet then we shall see face to face when we see Jesus. Though now abide faith and hope, the greatest really is love. If I have not charity, if love does not flow from me, I am nothing. Jesus, reduce me to love. We're talking about learning how to love. And using this third tool called interdependence as part of learning how to love. And we do that by learning these 12 one others and applying these 12 one another's. First six we've looked at. We one another pray for one another. We encourage one another. We build up or edify one another. We confess to one another. We honor one another. And we love one another. Another six coming next week. Let's stand to our feet. Let's in closing. Um, I'll tell you your assignment before I pray. Here's your assignment. Um, before you leave this building... Okay, before you leave this building, we're not going to put chains on the doors, but before you leave this building, practice one. I'm going to leave them on the board. I'm going to leave them up there. Practice one of those one another's. You could just grab someone and pray for them, or you could speak a word of encouragement to them. You could build them up somehow. Say, I'm proud of you. Man, you've done a good job today. You could confess to one another. Say, you know what? I need someone to talk to. We Let's go to the corner away from people. Let me, you know, or just honor one another. Or just do some sort of loving thing to one another. Can we do that? Uh, see, they're sneaking ahead. See that? They're already hugging each other, already loving on each other. You, those naughty people. <laughs> We're going to pray. And then please, before you leave, the, see, because what happens 
if we say one thing but we do another? What's that called theologically? That's called a... Yeah, hypocrisy. Thank you. I hate that. Yeah, it's not a nice word. It's not a nice word. I'm going to give you an opportunity to put into practice. Father, put your hand on your heart. F Father, we just, we pray. God, some days we don't know how to love. Some days the most loving thing that we need is someone to kick us in the rear and to say, you've got to learn how to love. Father, teach us. Jesus, reduce us to love. Lord, as we've gone through these first six, I pray that you've put your finger on some things in our lives. You've taught us specific responses to love. And today we pray we could apply those things so that before we leave this place, God, you're going to give us the grace to apply one of these six one another's. And then, God, I pray you would give us the grace to apply another one during the week at work, at home, to a family member, to our next-door neighbor. Jesus, teach us to love. Because if we're honest, we would have to admit, sometimes we don't know how to love. Jesus, teach us how to love. We pray that in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.